I wish we could control the heat with our phones. No. Welcome, everyone. It's Wednesday once again. Wednesday night fly time. Wednesday night fly time. Oops, I didn't turn our there. Our audio is on now, Brian. Sorry right. about that, everyone. Perfect. Wednesday night um, live time. So far, we've already got 16 people in. Um, use that chat window down below to say hi to Johnny Ray so he knows you are tuning in. I know Mr. Jim Heck called me today and said he would abstain from Michigan basketball just for you. What? So, yeah, yeah. Dang. Dude, so, great. That's what pretty, time was the game? I can get it done. Cool. I think it was 8 o'clock nice. start. Brian's tuning in already. Hey, Brian, how are you? Good to see you. Um, Brian, will you talk about John a little bit for a minute or two here? So John is one of my uh, great guys here on the in the area. Um, one of my favorite dudes to fish around. He's super polite, always been a great guy. I have a ton of respect for Johnny Ray. Um, I've been told I had a man crush on him at one point, but you know, that's, that's just hearsay. Um, no, he's, he's awesome. And, uh, we're super happy to be bringing such a great and talented local tire. Somebody that really thinks about, um, you know, fly development and, you know, we were just, we just had a great discussion about colors and what does it mean, um, when you're selecting anything, whatever type of fish you're going for. So really intuitive angler intuitive guy very professional um like i said a pleasure to always guy around and and, and be around so thanks for doing this John. no we problem thank you brian and thank Finally. you matt as well yeah absolutely we're, we're really excited to bring john he's a sa ambassador newly anointed is that what they do? i don't know like i don't know like i don't think you get like a crown or anything like no i don't <laughs> not this year maybe no next yeah year. well you know Moon yeah, whatever. Yeah. I know you guys get together with the cloaks and chants. Right. right. <laughs> Late night. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, we've been excited about Johnny for a few weeks. He's going to yeah. be doing some small mouth lives tonight. Um, again, let us know. Hey, Joe's tuning in. Uh, is the audio okay for everyone? And I hope it's not too echoey tonight. But uh, if you're watching on your phone, make sure you get the app. Otherwise, you will not be able to use the chat feature. And mm -hmm. if you haven't done so yet, think about hitting the subscribe button. You'll get notifications when we have new tires. Um, let's see. S. Borchard. I don't, know. Right. That, well, I don't know who that is, but welcome, welcome. Uh, Borchelt. Borchelt. I can't read that font, so what are you going to do? <laughs> <laughs> let's try. Only, well, only gets on. harder. <laughs> so. All right. Uh, you... Tell us about mangled fly. Oh, man, yeah. mangled fly. So probably the first thing is, what is mangled fly? So uh, this bait actually kind of, um, when it gets all like crumpled up and destroyed, that's where, first of all, the name came from. And I like to shoot photography in taking fish pictures with flies just like destroyed is kind of the premise behind the name. And then uh, we're in our just had our one year anniversary as a guide service here in Northern Michigan. So there's three of us that work together, uh, myself, Ed McCoy and Jeff Top, And uh, we guide the Manistee primarily in Northern Michigan and Jeff spends the summer in Alaska. And uh, Ed is, uh, if you haven't looked up any of his mouse patterns, we have a couple YouTube slash Vimeo channels that will feature some of the tires at Mangled Fly, so but all great tires, all great yeah. guys. You have an awesome staff, yeah. Johnny. So big influences in how I think about tying, and so we were, you know, blessed to have people that share their knowledge, and you pick up on little tidbits, and you just become better. So sure, yeah, that's awesome. So shall we tie a fly? Yeah. Let's go ahead and tie a fly. All right. Um, all right. We got Ted's also saying hi to John and uh, John Reed as well. Cool. We've got a bunch of people in. Awesome. Nice. Light volume, Matt. John. All right. So, <laughs> what we're going to tie is kind of one of my uh, favorite smallmouth baits. And uh, I will call a fly a bait. And if that offends anybody, I'm sorry. But that's how I think about it because it's what fish want to eat. So, this bait here um, kind of was inspired by a, the old school banjo minnow. A lot of bass guys will throw plastics, and I can still remember as a little kid 
seeing that plastic bait just kind of barely beneath the surface twisting and turning and undulating and then they'd show these monster bass by i don't know if it was billy martin or somebody come up and just wallop it and if you bought you know five of these for 19.99 your mom would give you a credit card and you're knocking on your mom's door but hey mom i want to get these so but anyway that's kind of where this started and I had the pleasure of uh working with kevin feenstra many years ago video that we did and he had a fly that he called the bass detector and uh, pretty much the same template had a little bit different design but he would fish it the same way and i would uh, fish with kevin during the filming and prior to and kevin's you know a very accomplished angler and knows his river really well and he would fish these flies really high in the surface and it you know really grabbed my attention to watching these bass come up and attack stuff and you know brian can speak for this as well that we have to do so much steelhead fishing and our season is six months long that we're always underneath the surface and we don't really get to watch steelhead come eat something even when you're swinging a fly or you're bobber fishing or chuck and ducking it's all like you have to believe so when i go trout fishing and when i go smallmouth fishing i really enjoy making the fish come up for the bait and if i can fish smallmouth just below the surface and they're pretty aggressive and smallmouth love to hunt with their eyes so they're going to always look up and see things and this is you know really in our northern michigan environment out of lakes they're super clear so you're always going to see them come up and then in the rivers when i have an opportunity to fish for these bass it's always in the summer and that's our lowest conditions our clearest water so this this fly how i like to tie it the incorporation of what i call the hammerhead series which i'll get into the eye placement allows this bait just to sink underneath the surface and then you can twitch it and undulate it and move it around uh, one of the key things that changed this year for me with this fly was one of uh, essay's new lines uh, it's the the first part of it it's called the i23 and it's an intermediate with a sink two to a sink three and if i run that line with this fly I, i'm probably only getting a foot down and for all our rivers, if I can keep the fly in that zone, I can work around timber, I can work around logs, smallmouth will come up for it. The old way I used to fish with, fish it was the Titan floating line. And then I'd put just a little bit of split shot, like on a nine foot leader. And then I'd run this fly just behind that on a section of tippet, about 12 pound test. And then it would get to that same zone. But now that I can rid the split shot, it makes casting a lot easier and makes the the bait actually fish a lot better then i'm gonna show you one of my inspirations on colors and if everybody doesn't have this book yet it's not only a great reference tool for all our steelhead fishing that we like to do but you get to learn about color combinations for some of the darters that are featured in this book and this is by my good friend kevin feenstra uh, you can buy this book w from the Northern Angler, um, and it will really inspire you to tie certain things. And I was looking through here this morning, and kind of what I'll do is I'll fish this fly for chubs. So in the spring, what I learned by Kevin's book is that chubs like to turn to an orangish copper tone. So this fly, if you were to tie that for the early smallmouth that are migratory in our river systems, that that would be a good color. And then I'm really tying today's fly for sunny conditions. And one of my favorite bait fish to imitate is the log perch, or what otherwise I know in the Hoden pile section is the trout perch. So um, it's a darter, and this fly is one of my sunny conditions. So smallmouth fishing for me, and Brian and I were talking about it, like flies that you wanna fish during the sun, and then flies that you wanna fish on cloudy days and we'll incorporate some of the materials in here and so this is my sunny day fly two hooks that i like to go with uh, for this series are both by arex uh, one is a ns122 light stinger which is the one i put in the vise tonight and then the other one that we listed on the site was the tp610 which is the trout predator and then i run that one in a size two and then this one's gonna be in a, yeah, this one's the two, sorry. So, and 
We're going to just start off by adding some thread. Not really picky about thread color. I just picked like a tan neutral color today to start off with. And how I always usually start all my flies is I'm pretty much, if I tie a streamer, if I tie anything other than a dry fly, a swing fly, a smallmouth bait, a pike bait, a musky bait, I'm always usually incorporating some sort of weighting system into the fly. And it's dumbbells, uh, wrapping lead around the back. So this fly, we're gonna start off with adding weight to the front. And why I always add the eyes first is it helps me set up my proportions. So I add the Hammerhead series eyeballs to that. They're on top right now. A couple easy wraps, flip them to the underside and then just secure them with some nice figure eights. Matt, am I in focus? Everything working? Apparently just great. Okay. You did a great job trimming your nails. Well, I, that was actually the last thing right before I left the house today, <laughs> is I was like, all right, I got my sweatshirt, it's got my logo on it, and I was sitting there and I was like, oh, my nails, I'm gonna be on camera. <laughs> so I was like, ah, clip, 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 clip. So, I always bring a set just in case. Yeah. So anyway, we are we are clean for everybody there, so we can't get picked on by that. But we have our eyes now underneath the hook, and what that's going to do is allow this fly to ride exactly, basically how the hook is. Um, if you want to make it more of a clouser type fly, you do a heavier set of eyes on the top part. These are small chain eyes. I really enjoy the pink ones on this. I don't have a reason other than it adds a little bit of bling to it but you can do silver, gold, whatever your preferences are. So we're gonna move the thread now to the back here. Maybe set up the thread so it's even with the barb of the hook. And then we're gonna use, kind of for me, a, a new material um, for this. I have tied this fly with bucktail off the back. I've tied it with the French bucktail, which is called Faux. <laughs> What is it? Fake? Faux. 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 So, which is the fake bucktail, which was a synthetic kind of wispy material by Flyman. And that actually added a lot of good action to the back. And then just recently I got into this strong fuzzy fiber, which is now my new favorite. So it's an interesting material to work with. Um, you know, one of the common things that you hear is like how much material you're going to use. So we're just kind of kind of getting this by feel. And we're gonna get just a little bit more than that. And that feels about right. And you can do this a couple ways. Usually I'm gonna tie more than one of these flies at a time. So I'm gonna just get the whole strand, kind of pull out the extra fibers. Brian has to mop the floor tomorrow. So we're not gonna be worried about it. We're gonna measure pretty much the length of the hook. And then right here, I'll kind of pull, pull it apart so it's not like a fresh cut. And I'll just separate the fibers. Come back in, kind of just looking for about the length of the hook. And that's my mark right there. Switch hands, come here, give it some good thread tension. Come back, a couple wraps, pull, and secure it nice and tight. And that's what you're gonna have. I'll come in with my scissors and I'll clean that up. All right, so durability wise, right here, that material, based on what it is, it's gonna wanna rotate. So if you want to add super glue right now to that thread base, that will secure that that will always stay there. So you come in here and just kind of lock those in and you're good to go. All right, so to add a little bit of length now to our tail, uh, one of my, like my easy materials that gives you a lot of movement for a small mount is craft fur. And working with craft fur can be a little bit interesting. So we're gonna come down here, cut ourselves a little piece. And we're gonna kind of like look at it and it's looking good. All right, so in this part right here, what we wanna do is we wanna pull that junk out in waste paper basket or whatever, but I'll just kinda maybe come into the middle of the fibers and then 
use my fingers and you're seeing how much little extra is in there and if you do it right you get this kind of like static effect and there you go so that's going to be our tail go into the same time platform or time point one nice one pull down and lock it in you can kind of see that fuzzy fiber now supports it really nice if you don't use this like this back part bucktail or the other synthetic bucktail the crafter if i put flash on top will come in and then wrap around the hook so what you're trying to do is support these fibers so that the end tail and how we're going to fish this fly on those light intermediate lines will allow you to bounce that fly and the flash will bounce up and down. Some people ask me, like, why don't you run a sink tip? Um, what I found with smallmouth bass is that a sink tip, like a straight 25 foot SA 250 grain on a seven weight would sink my fly really nicely but I couldn't control the speed of the fly very well. Smallmouth bass are very visual predators, but they tend to like the fly, especially in the summertime, and you know maybe it's just how I like the fly, but they want it to almost come to a stop sometimes. Like find the point within the run where the ambush point is, and that can be a ledge, it can be a rock, it can be a tree. So that sink tip as it sinks, keeps pulling your fly down, bellies out and pulls it through the current, and I couldn't control the speed of the fly as well. So the intermediate lines, the floating lines, and that new one from SA, the I-2-3, has really helped that fly where I can bounce it up, it'll stay in that column, that point in that run where I want it, and I can control the speed. So when that fish starts to accelerate up to that fly, I can twitch it, pause it, and then they'll just swallow it. All right, so we talked about this being a sunny, sunny day, fly one of my like favorite colors to throw on the tannic ish manistee waters is a little bit of gold so you can find yourself some speckled flashaboo in gold straight gold whatever you want but uh, montana fly group now has these blends in this silver copper gold mix has been pretty fishy for me so if you don't have it yet, definitely contact Brian here at the Northern Angler and they can get it for you. So what I'm going to do is kind of just get a nice little hunk of it. I don't know how much that is, like how many fibers, but more is always better when it comes to smallmouth, I think. Flash is key. We're going to have it kind of in our hand. We're going to, again, kind of just like pull it apart so we make a nice little tail. Kind of measure it up. To the end of the craft fur come back give it a nice soft wrap and then a couple nice hard wraps all right we're gonna lock this flash in now and what we're looking for is like if we pull this back we want to come about halfway back on the fly so I've kind of marked that in my head come back this way and then what I do is I do a like a staggered little cut there's probably like a hairdresser out there that that's called this, but I don't know what that's called. So then I take my finger, put it on top and kind of splay it. Then come in, wrap pull, and lock that in. All right, this sneaky little material, which I don't think made the Northern Angler site, but they will gladly get you this as well is the lateral scale the opal mirage this is a very sneaky material for sunny days uh, I didn't quite understand its full potential until I had the opportunity to fish for golden dorado and every single fly that the Argentinian guides had had this in it and when you're fishing Argentina in for golden dorado it's basically summertime down there in January and February and it's basically sunny every day. It's hot, it's like a hundred degree hot. So I started incorporating this in a very small amount into my smallmouth flies and definitely noticed that it's a very friendly summer, summer day, sunny condition material. And then as a side note, for anybody that enjoys swinging steelhead baits, 
you might want to add this to it as well. So less is more with this. So I usually just add two little strains. And what I'm going to try to do is put it on one side closer to me, and then I'm going to flip it over and put it on the other side. So I'm kind of measuring the back end here. Lock it in. Bring my thread forward. Pull. Three times. Fold it. Wrap it. Pull it back. And pull. All right. So I could measure the back side, and I'll come here, look at it, and just give it a slight trim to the same length as that crafter. How we doing, boys? Doing great. All right. We'll keep on rolling. Uh, we did have one quick question uh, from Brian. is asking, what will the appropriate finished final length of this fly work out to typically? Bam. Let me get a tape measure. Mm, four? Yeah. We good on that? Yeah, four. All right. <clears throat> you can definitely, with smallmouth, you can fish a lot bigger fly. And they will, they're, they're pretty aggressive predators. As bait fish on the, bait fish for the majority of bait fish, and you'll learn this in that book as well, is that majority of the bait in Michigan will spawn in the spring. So your bait is at its biggest in the spring. By the time I get the opportunity to fish for smallmouth bass, and this is based off of don't feel sorry for me, but I don't really get a fish for bass until July and August. So our bait is growing from its immature little phase into adulthood into the fall. So the bait is not at its biggest in the middle of the summer. So I tend to find that smaller size flies you know, on sixes or twos tend to give me more numbers. I will say that, you know, I had the opportunity to fish with Ed McCoy and we were fun fishing and I was running these and doing just fine. Ed stuck with a eight foot, eight foot, <laughs> eight to 10 inch black game changer craft fur monster. And he definitely pulled bigger fish out, but his numbers were three to four fish where I was more in the 20 to 30 fish. So I find if I stick with this pattern, I'm definitely gonna have more fish influenced into it. There was also having the opportunity to have Kevin is one of my good friends. He took GoPro cameras down into this rock hole on the Manis, no, in the Muskegon. And he was catching crayfish and throwing them into the hole where the the bass were and he would have the little ones and the big lobster ones and the bass would not eat the lobster they would gobble every single little one up that he threw in there so if you're fishing later in the summer for smallmouth bass and maybe even pressured you know this fly here for me is a, a pretty small bait even for trout standards but it's definitely one of my most effective sizes. All right. Next thing we're gonna do is grab like a schloppin size saddle feather and we're gonna tie it in tip first. So what I'm looking for here is it's gonna help me keep volume on the fly you can also fill this space in with a variety of things, but this little technique here has been one of my like new favorite ways to add a little bit of sparkle. So I'm kind of looking for a feather that's got a little bit of point to it. It's not going to be, you know, one of the biggest feathers in my clump. So we're going to grab it here, kind of pull it apart and tie it in right there where we did the flash. We'll just add a couple wraps. Get rid of that end. And just because I'm not completely believing that's gonna lock in, we'll just add there. All right, now we're gonna look for our UV polar. 
And this will come in a little bag. And if you have your bag, you can control it. If you don't have your bag, sometimes just like clipping a little bit of it is simpler. All right, tie that in with the feather. And we're gonna advance our thread forward just to the eyes there. So earlier we showed one of the common shiners and in that book, it's bright orange right here in the middle. So that's where I'm you know, learning that today that if I took like an orange schloppen feather in like copper UV polar chenille, that would really imitate that bait fish. And then I would do black right here in the head because just like gobies and shiners, usually the males will have really black heads. So if you're again fishing in the springtime more than I am in like the summer, that would be kind of what I would do here. All right, we're gonna use our loon gator grip tool. And we're gonna go to the base here of our stem, the thickest part of that feather. And we're gonna clip both those materials together. All right, so we have our thread here forward and we're just gonna sit here and spin it. I know that's three, five, six, 15 times. That was a good Christian education there for counting. And I just take my comb here and I'm just kind of pulling out, gently pulling those materials out with that flash. I'm gonna just take it, wrap it nice and slow, pulling it forward. And sometimes those things will kind of get locked in. Just kind of take your comb, pull it out. Good there. Come back, just kind of like pull those feathers, fibers. Advance your thread. Again, we talked about like sunny type conditions. Gold for me on smallmouth bass with the manistee color green, a little bit of tannic. Is definitely, you know, since I've been fishing down there, and I think this will be my 19th season, gold definitely in the sunny conditions is one of my favorite colors. So we have based the gold in there with the white, and then you can see how that feather's giving it just a little bit of volume. Lock the thread in, and we're building our fly up. All right, so the next can of worms we're gonna open is what I call hot spotting. And again, pretty much, even when I tie dry flies now, um, I'm incorporating some sort of UV factor. And for anybody that's a steelhead angler, um, this is probably an important part. Uh, so we learned a lot from steelhead because we do that a lot. Probably six months of steelhead angling, so you can definitely watch fish behavior. So with smallmouth bass and then the musky program that we're doing in the fall, that understanding how much light is coming into the water and then hot spotting patterns or adding barring into our flies by dulling out the UV has really helped our success rate on like streamer presentations. So if I take, I don't have these all in bags because I got them in different bulk. But if I took these three yarns and I hit it with a light, you can see which one is glowing. So we're going to add this Senyo dub into the end part or the middle part of the fly to hot spot it. And then we're going to dull it out with the brown in front. And if we had really tannic water, it was even dirtier than normal, we could, <coughs> excuse me, take the fly, get rid of the brown, and do all chartreuse. So I'll tend to have a couple of these flies tied a certain way. And 
you know, based on conditions of the water, if I didn't know from the day before, then, you know, I could, you know, have higher success based on what the fish are seeing. I'll usually tend to tie three flies before every trip that I do based on I was there yesterday and I saw that the fish liked a certain thing. And if you've had the opportunity to tune in to the Northern Anglers videos, um, they had Alex Lafkis here two or three weeks ago. And there's a point in his um, talk where he talks about fishing probably one of the better trout sections in the state of Michigan and keeping fish interested all day, even though the, the conditions probably weren't ideal. There's some days where you go fishing and the fish are just on. But Alex did a great job talking about how he changed his fly so that the fish stayed engaged. And there's, there's, there's no different, like when I steelhead fish, like I have to change the bait, the fly, throughout the date based on light penetration. I do the same thing with this smallmouth fly. So understanding that most of the bait fish is a certain size, I'm not coming into the river going, oh man, they're on log perch today. I'm going into the river thinking they're seeing chartreuse a certain way, they're seeing pink a certain way, they're seeing all white a certain way and how what the water looks like and what the sun is doing i'll change my fly accordingly so this template allows me to add you know a hot spot in here but i could keep that chartreuse through the whole thing or i could you know put it just a little bit or none so anyway when i'm gonna hot spot i don't use a ton of it but what i'm gonna do here is I'm just gonna take the material and it's kind of laid out in my hand and I'm gonna come into the fly, wrap it slow, and then just pull it to the side. So it's kind of like veiled, all right? So this material is not at the right length. So now I'm gonna come in, grab it, and pull on it. Pull it towards me and then just kind of look at it. So I kind of want it supported on the wing. So it's a little bit long on that side. And then we're good. All right, and again, like some of my key colors right here that I like the hot spot on is that you can get a really good pink one. Uh, the Sanyo Laser Dub um, comes in, I don't know, Brian would know exactly how many colors it is, but let's just say, what was that? Ice cream place. Fancy flavors. Rock, yeah. Flavors. But it's way more than 31. <laughs> so, <clears throat> all right. The next one I'm going to do is like a brown color. Uh, I've also done like a tan or a black. Sometimes I'll I'll blend them. So I'm going to take the, that dubbing and just kind of pull it apart. Kind of feeling like how much do I need? Like if I'm looking at that right there, that feels in my hand just like a little bit too much. So I'm just gonna pull a little bit out, put it on the table. Then I learned this trick from Kelly Gallup watching his laser minnow, laser dub minnow, I think it's called. And you do a little bit of a wedge there, pull it down, keep that thread tension, lock it in. And then it's just gonna kind of sit there on top. Now I'll flip this over and I'll do like a cream color or a light tan. Again, I kind of pull this apart. Feeling it, and that's just way too much. Pull some out, put it to the side. Come here, lock it. Pull, keep that tension and pull it forward. Flip it back over. A little bit more brown. Pull it apart. Grab that little piece that we had from before. Feels about right. Pinch it with your thread. And back here get that little wedge 
pull, pop, and finish. All right, so on this fly, I'm always trying to add more material to the top than I am the bottom. And part of that is just so that that fly rides right. All right, come in here, do a little finger whip finish. Pop, use my little loon. Hit that. Everybody close your eyes. And then you can kind of see that hot spot in there right now. But we'll lock that one up. All right. Back in the day, I'd be done. Like, I would just be like, that's it. And then you sit there and you're up in the musky camp and Ed McCoy's spending 45 minutes trimming a fly. You're like, man, this fly looks good. So now I spend just a little bit more time. So I take my brush, pull my materials out. What else do you have to do? Mom? Right. <laughs> <laughs> it's not like you have anything else to do. All right. So you have this extra. So what I'm going to do is grab my, my two fingers and my thumb, pinch, and I'm kind of getting the height of my mohawk. And I'm just going to pull it off. Kind of look at it. And I'm like, ooh, pretty. Flip it over. Now this one, what I always want to do is like, I'll use the hook gauge because I don't like it if that material gets in there. So I'll go a little bit tighter to the base, pinch that as hard as I can because you don't want to pull it out because you'd be like, oh man, on camera. There we go. Boom. A little bit flashy in the back there, but not too bad. And that's our little smallmouth fly. Usually I'm running these like off 12 pound fluorocarbon. Uh, if I'm running that I-23, I'm just going right off the I-23, that Titan, it's a, just a sink tip ISA that gets down just a little bit like we talked about before. Three foot, three and a half foot, straight 12 pound, little loop knot, cast and go. If I'm on a Titan Taper where it's a more of a floating line, I'm probably gonna run a nine foot leader uh, like that bass leader that they have that is 9 foot 16. Uh, sometimes I'll add like a little micro barrel and then I'll go straight 12 pound off that. So my total length of my leader is like 11 foot. Really simple to cast, really, sim really simple to fish and it imitates a lot, lot of bait fish. One of the other things that sometimes I'll do um, that we talked about like dulling out UV that I'll buy these little prism markers. Uh, there's a one that I was watching a gentleman's feed and they have like gold markers now. So we'll try that one on this one, but I'll come in here to add some barring. I'll flip it over. There we go. That looks great. Yeah, that looks fantastic. That looks really yeah, good. It, it does, it does kind, kind of, with that barn, barn especially it's like the log perch. I'm definitely going to borrow that, uh, the tear it off technique. It's similar to a, a fly I, I squeeze some eyes okay. to. It has a real vertical back and forth sure. kind of. And I usually trim the bottom okay. just to keep it keeling right, but I like that tearing it because the cutting always. It doesn't, it doesn't blend, blend as well sure. because you have a really abrupt cutting surface. Anyways. Yeah. No, I was watching Ed just like, I was like, maybe I should try that. Do uh, you want to answer some questions sure. now? Yeah, um, I know you did cover it, but we'll just cover it again. Spencer asked uh, about water type for this um, and clarity. Okay. I'll we'll just revisit that real quick yeah. for this. So um, one of the probably the toughest conditions for me to catch a bass is in dirty water. So bass have a tendency to be visual hunters. So uh, Spencer, if you have conditions that are dirty, 
then I go straight top water, uh, making a big chug or a loud noise on the excuse me top will be your best bet. Typical conditions for me on the Manistee are low and clear in the summer. So bass, which I said before, and people still doubt this, but you know I could ask Brian. He'd I. I don't even know his answer, but I'm going to guess it's less than five. Every steelhead trip that he's ever run in his 20 plus years of guiding, how many smallmouth have you caught in the fall? Oh, um, probably around five or six. Okay, so I was one off. So anyway, I have a huge belief that smallmouth, as soon as the kings show up, huge migration out of the river. So they come into the river based on what I believe is the crayfish molt. And then some fish will spawn in the manistee, and they'll start to show up. Spawning temperature for bass is 60, do you know? I think 60, it is right around 60, 60, 62. From, from the, the bay? yeah. Okay. okay. So, so they're going to be coming in in that May time if there is going to be a population that comes into the river. Same thing holds true below Tippy, below the Hoden Pile, those... Um, Reservoirs, Manistee Lake, that's where the population is. So in the summer, after hex season, is when I have an opportunity to go smallmouth fishing. So the water's low and clear, it's summer flows, it's usually beautiful, Manistee green. All these flies that I like to tie, from pink to chartreuse to white, even black, just stands out. So when you're throwing these flies into these log jams, um, bass will come almost feels like they're running towards it but if you can fish it slow they'll have a chance to catch up as you're floating by in your you know kayak drift boat jet sled whatever you're fishing out of for other systems out there again i look at a lot of my opportunities where i guide that it's going to be a summer summer into fall bait and as king populations have dwindled we're finding more water to fish for smallmouth that we previously didn't have to go look at where smallmouth definitely hold up in good populations and these baits are definitely good ones that you can have so water depth for me is usually like if i look at the river and i don't know where to cast but i look to the left and i'm like man that is the sexiest steelhead run i've ever seen I throw to the other side and I find a lot of the bass are in on the the insides or the shallow sides or the woody spots and then that corresponds to like where is the bait like where are the crayfish where are the minnows those are the ambush points that the smallmouth are going to use also smallmouth tend to be a lot like me they're really lazy so they they like food to come to them so they're going to sit in spots that are slower than your typical trout spots. They're going to sit in spots that have a lot of food and they're just going to be lazy. So back again to if you heard about like that sink tip versus intermediate line and being able to control your speed of your fly. That's where, you know, these fish will climb up because it's an easy way to ambush food is right underneath it. So keeping your fly higher in the column. And then fishing it slow and having a fly with a little bit of weight in an intermediate line, you know, and then you can cover like even those shallow runs that bass like to sit in where you can just keep it, you know, a foot down and it's only three foot of all wood. So. Thanks, John. Mm -hmm. So um, one of the things that I do like about that whole intermediate presentation is you can actually stop the fly and stall it. Mm -hmm. You know, I think that's what you're getting at, you know, what you can't really do with a sinking line. Right. Um, you know, with a floating line, it's not as effective because you're not really getting below the surface. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so it is like the perfect combination. I've even been using those lines in the late summertime for trout. Oh, yeah. With streamers because, you know, they can't see that big dark line and, and you know, you can, you can swim your bait. Mm -hmm. You can swim your bait way more effectively with those lines than you can with a sinking line. Um, yeah, probably... We do have a question you kind of touched sure. upon top water, you know, like okay. dirt, dirty water. So yep. we had a question from um, a, while back. a little while ago, um, but we had a question about what would what would be your uh, top like what kind of top water patterns would you look for 
Um, maybe besides like Google bugs or like the obvious sure. stuff. So <clears throat> you could take if if you know you guys watched Tie in the Fly, and you had you went back to where we you could probably even do it right at the point where I tied in the craft fur, then just put foam over the top. And you could still do, you'd have that foam tied in, do the saddle, and then put foam at the end. And it would, like, it's the gurgler from, what's his name? He was out in Massachusetts, passed away. But Gartside. Gartside, Jack. Gartside, that type of fly, that dying minnow, again, I'm very attracted to thinking that bass eat a lot of bait. And, yes, like... The thing that we were playing around with this summer a little bit was trying to get them on mice, you know, where you'd set the boat up and you'd wake big mice patterns across. And, you know, it's almost like you were doing a dry fly swing presentation, you know, out west. And they would definitely blow up on them. But if you're in a floating boat, like chugging or twitching, like a, a foam based minnow pattern on the top of the float line, I think is a lot of fun. I don't tend to sit there when I buy a popper and think that, wow, this is a frog. I don't think that way, even though it's green base with a yellow belly. I don't think that. I think back to like when a fish is coming up, a bass is coming up underneath the fly, why will he bite it? No different like when I fish hopper patterns, you know, and it's back to me like we're going to even go right back to like steelhead beads. So steelhead beads, like egg flies, whatever you guys want to say, there's a million colors. So certain days they're going to bite X, Y, or Z. No different when we're hopper fishing. It's the same foam with five rubber legs, but there's a million colors. But one day, black with red outfishes blue with pink. And you're like, why? Well, what does the fish see? So when I fish bass, it's no different. When I have those bugle bugs, of course, the first one I always throw is yellow. Because why? Because I probably throw it the most and I catch the most fish on it. But it's not like they see that yellow bait is something. Um, so topwater flies, the other one that's pretty cool right now, and it's a new fly coming out from Montana Fly Group, from and Brian I'm sure will have in the shop, but it's the world's biggest grasshopper. And it's from the guys out in Minnesota, in Wisconsin, and I forget what they call it, but it's got 25 rubber legs, double dip foam, and the guys down in Argentina for Dorado would also throw it. And they would have, it would be on a two-aught streamer hook with six layers of foam and rubber legs everywhere. And when the bass, like, when they only chase your streamer but not bite it, if you can come up with a lazy topwater fly that doesn't make a lot of bang for its buck, but just kind of skitters, like it's a damsel or a moth or just something struggling, it was interesting to watch, especially late season when we've all fished to these bass all through the summer, coming up with a easy, lazy topwater fly in these, you know, God, I wish I knew the name of them. But they're just really big grasshoppers, basically. I'm working on a murder hornet pattern. I don't know about you. Which one? <laughs> a murder hornet. Oh. <laughs> it's going to be big. big. Just wait. It's, it's what really is, I've heard another cicada rumor really? this year. Yeah. Yeah. Really? yeah. I saw it on the old uh, interwebs that we're going to get a. It's not probably going to get this far north, but it's right. definitely in the Ohio Valley. We got some. Great questions, guys. Keep them coming. This is wonderful. And this was, this is our idea with this is you're able to pick John's brain. And this is why I'm so happy he's here. He and Eddie and all the guys at Mangled Flyer, they think about why things work more than just going with it. Well, yellow for yellow, you know, mm -hmm. and they, you guys sit down and figure out why, you know, you in my mind, you kind of Tarantino yeah. it. What's, What's the fish, fish seeing, not what we yeah. see? So, um, like the balance of our group, which is interesting to watch, is that you have a scientific um, biology degree, and you have me that I'm like, just add more flash. So you get there's one the, in every group. I'm yeah. Not. So you get the <laughs> conflicting, in but it helps because Ed has taught me the Latin name in understanding that that bug hatches at ten and you better be there. And then I'm like, help him go like, 
You don't have to worry about it. It's a steelhead. Just add some ice dough to it, and you're fine. So it, the balance helps, and then when you sit there and then you're trying to figure out, like, some of these game fish, like hot spotting or whatever, and, you know, you've got Kevin's book and the photography and the research and his brain, and you're like, oh, if I add a little bit of orange here or there or chartreuse, you know, but it's it's no different than, you know, that's what I really like about the area that we're living in currently and working with you guys, you know, and it's a pleasure, and I can't imagine, like, being a guide and conflicting with other people. So just, like, having the conversation with Brian in the shop earlier, just, like, it, I don't know, there's something special about it. Even if, like, we don't work for the same company, we have the same goal. And it's all about making people understand and teaching them about angling, you know, so. We, we had a chorus of, of comments uh, say, uh, Mr. Wiggly. The there you go. The you Someone is paying attention. <laughs> nice work. Yeah. I knew it had to Get cool everyone's name. fish brain together. We'll, right. we'll figure it out. It'll also, like, if, the, if any, <laughs> yeah. well, the other thing is, like, sit here in front of the camera and remember. You're right. like, uh, yeah. You get the, um, we do the live thing. I'm not great at live. Mm. I'm, I'm not good at It's not Brian's favorite. Not but no, I think he's crushed it both time. times. You couldn't really tell the, the first, first time, time but. Let's see. Okay, let's uh, let's hit some. Somebody had a question about let's the do some water rap. clarity for this fly. We we hit so you that. Have like two to three feet of visibility. Right. Or yeah. Like, like maybe four to six. six. Yeah. So, so let's, let's say you you showed up to the river, and I would tie. This was like all right. What are the most conditions that I show up in? I got six foot of vis. So this is my sunny day combo, and then I'm also gonna tie this fly. It's an underrated color, but pink, right? So pink is going to be my cloudy day, a little bit of tannic. The The fly almost looks orange when you're fishing it in the water, but it's going to stand out. So that one is like less than, like you can still see it, but you maybe can't see the bottom in the deep spot. So, you know, and if I have like mud, I'd, I'm not fishing either one. So I need definitely visibility for also for that, that presentation that we've talked about like over and over again is that the fun part of this is seeing it in, you know, it's the one thing when I steelhead fish that I wish I could. It would be so awesome. Yeah. And I, I know guys are doing a great job getting them on a streamer and doing that program and, you know, but it is the one thing when I swing that I'm like, man, I wish I could watch that. You know, like how close do they get? You know, and how long do they follow? Right. So I had the opportunity a few years ago, Johnny. I was standing on top of my cooler, mm -hmm. and I'm watching a guy swing a fly. Right, like I'm, and in the water was just gin clear. Yep. And you know, it was a spot that Jay Eater sat and told me sure. about. And I'm like, you know, I, I want to see. Like, and it yep. was like I'd never seen the bottom in this spot, yeah. but it was super clear. So I could see this fish come out. And it would come out of the wood, and it chased this fly out to the sand. And it was, it was like, doing all these U-shapes. Never and felt it. It never touched the fly. <laughs> yeah. Right? Like, it never, it did it, like, three yep. times. And I've seen that, like, on the North Umpqua with Steelhead, sure. where they follow a fly. You're watching somebody fish down sure. below, and they have no idea what's going on. But you see one or two fish rise up. So I had that opportunity to see that with a Steelhead one day. You know, the short of it is, like, pull out the float rod. We're going to get that yeah. thing. You know, and we did. We just dropped a, a bead down and it yep. ate it. But sure. it was like, that fish wanted to, but it just wouldn't commit. Yeah. I tried two different patterns, yep. you know, and then it finally just, like, totally lost interest and hunkered back in the wood because mm -hmm. it kind of knew what was up. Sure. But I thought, man, we see that all the time with trout. We mm -hmm. see that all the time with smallmouth. And if you could see that with steelhead, Oof. like, oh, my gosh, how Oof. cool, yeah. you know, would that be? Like, yeah. you'd be totally addicted. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah. Absolutely. Uh, Smart Mouth, which is a great name, by the way, great username. <laughs> <laughs> or Smart – I probably screwed it up. It looks like Smart Mouth. But uh, asks if you'd talk briefly about hooks for bait fish patterns and the characteristics that are most important to you. Oh, man, this is going to get ugly. 
So I, we can do it real brief. No, I mean, it's all right. It's, it's hit no the bullet big deal. points. So <clears throat> I am of the newly formed, not a fan of the BT BT B10S group. I know. I have lost so many trout on that hook that I'm I'm starting a new petition. <laughs> like oh. never again. <laughs> So, and I'm not the only one. There's a there's a bunch of closet members. So, for me, what it is is the diameter of the hook. So, this one right here, when I pull on it. Pull that up again, Jim. There you go. Perfect. When I pull on it, it bends. All right? So there's a time and a place for a very rigid hook. And if I put a B10S in there, that thing is solid as rock. So I don't know if it's the gauge of the wire, but we recently did a blog post on Mangled Fly about steelhead hooks and talking about like your bead hook, like what's your go-to bead hook and what is your go-to swing hook and talking to the guys on the crew and why. And there is definitely a correspondence within the group about the size of the wire. So there is a time and a place for that big hook. But if I feel like I might just go back to the 2461 Daiichi for a variety of my like streamer patterns. Because that thing is perfect. The only problem I had with it is that it will bend. and But it will hook them. So if I just got to take off the gas from the rod to land it, maybe that's what I got to do. But it has been something where I used to tie this fly always on a B10S. And for smallmouth, how they grab the bait is a lot different than a trout. They'll actually, they have that suck in mechanism and then they have a lot of soft tissue on the inside. So I'll have a definitely higher hookup range with a B10S. But for just trying to get in a habit and trying to find the right shank to tie these on. The the A-Rex stuff has been really good for me. And, you know, it's probably the one weakest part of my personal understanding is what hooks are out there. And, like, I wish I was, like, more in a shop and saw stuff or catalogs dropped off. But that's that's where I'm at is I look for a hook that will that will bend. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, Smart Mouth, we nailed the, the name, by the way. says, okay. thank you. No problem. Great reply. Great, very articulated. Uh, we had a question from Chris. Uh, if you'd briefly revisit the hot spotting tactic again, uh, and specifically ask if you're meaning more sun mean more fluorescent material or opposite. So opposite. Uh, <clears throat> feels like... Um, how I first found out about this guy, right? And what I mean, if you can see that right now on camera, when I don't have it on and you have this light, is the first time I heard about UV properties was from a walleye guide. And he's a tournament guy. Like, I don't know how many hundreds of thousands of dollars circulate through that. But there's, there's a UV spray. And you can spray your your hard baits and he's a troller and he's like yeah there's definitely an amount of spray that i need to add to get the best results and that is where one of the first triggers started going into my head that i'm like wow we have a lot of like uv properties and then you get this light and you're like wow that dubbing really glows and then you get another dubbing even though it's pink like I have two pinks here and before I embarrass myself on camera. Yeah, so I have two pinks and you can see one is just killing it and the other is not. And where I add that into the fly, it feels like, and again, I forget the gentleman's name that was asking the question, but I could go all pink, hot pink, all heart chartreuse here if my water is tannic. If it's clean, what I feel like is that I need to blend the hot spotting into the fly. 
in on this fly i like it within the body of the fly and it's almost like a glow in there the other thing i'll do is like these markers one of the best crankbait guides that i know always has a marker on them and he'll dull out the baits as he goes the other one that kevin talks about in his book is carrying a marker he'll tie the same fly and he'll color it up i learned about coloring up a fly when i was midge fishing in colorado we would tie all our flies white and then we would carry markers and marker them up so hot spotting and changing colors that's the only thing we can do is fly anglers but i feel like you can do this for steelhead smallmouth musky trout and where you put your hot spot is based off of water clarity, sun penetration. So if it's sunny, I usually do less. If it's cloudy, I do more. And I'm same thing when I swing a fly, like the ice dubs in the front. Like if it's cloudy, I'm doing chartreuses and oranges. If I'm doing um, sunny day conditions, I'm usually doing possum or this brown senior dub in the front. So that's kind of how I'll I'll blend my hot spotting. Awesome, good questions, guys. Keep them coming. Uh, I don't think we've worn John out yet. Nope. Uh, he hasn't even gone to his water lately. I'm he impressed. Has, ooh, that's thirsty. <laughs> yeah. Do you want to go ahead and tie that other one? Yeah, we can do the pink um, one. Yeah, it's the same. I mean, it's the same up template. To you guys, we're at so, an hour right now. Um, so you just want to whip one off, like, okay. and then you don't have to go through all Ultra the Ultra speed okay. fly. You could do guide speed. <laughs> I, wish I, I don't know. I might. I don't know if we can handle guide speed. It's like warp speed. <laughs> I'm not that fast. <laughs> uh, so, while you're prepping for that, we sure. did have someone ask uh, RLT Outdoors, which I think, I think is a friend of ours. Um, I think that's Justin. I think that's Justin. Uh, asked. Do you find certain times of the year where popper fishing is more productive than others? And I think I know the answer, but this is for you, John. I I mean, I probably don't have like a time, like I definitely have a time of day, but like time of year, like I'd be curious to hear you maybe, would you say early? Well, I think it's more, water temperature water water temperature, temperature. Water temperature? Yeah. Yeah. okay yeah so like what i'll notice is that if um during the middle of the day like again remember july and august if it's cloudy i'm gonna throw it all day if it's sunny i don't feel like it can get them to come to a popper if we're doing mr wiggly if we're doing grasshopper, damsel, something dead drift, yeah, I have a really good chance. So if you're, if anybody here is watching and, you know, you're taking like a, you're a newbie, a beginner, a kid, there's, topwater is a, a great tactic. This streamer here definitely needs an angler. And I'm not talking so much like the cast, like, I feel like if I can have somebody cast 25 feet, I got a chance. 25 feet doesn't seem very far, but if it goes 10, I'm very limited. But 25, I got a chance. 40 is ideal. So where the angling comes in is manipulation of the fly. Like I need movement from the fly. I, I don't always want it to be the same. I need it to be that you're, you're killing it, pausing it, dying it at the spots where we're floating along that are ideal. So if you're having somebody new come along and they can't give you that, then throwing top water allows you to throw it out there, dead drift it, keep pace with the boat, and then chug it in the right spot. And it'll, it will stay at that distance. So that's what's nice about top water. If you can bang it and you can cast it and you can put it in the cooks and crannies and wiggle it and pop, yeah, they'll, they'll probably come up, especially for that guard side gurgler, Mr. Wiggly. But if you're talking about Zud Bugs, that big pop that Matt has, then I always think later in the day or early morning. 
Yeah, and my, I mean, for me, and this is an answer for anyone who's brand spanking new, my brain always works kind of like a, a dichotomous key. If you remember those, you know, you start with a really simple question and then you... Dichotomous? Yeah. You threw that word out. Yeah. I, I did. Playing Scrabble. Look, Google that one. Yeah, that but I mean, I think word. it's it's basically an order of progression for your decisions. Right. Is the best way to think of that. So, water temperature is always primary, and then you kind of branch down into water conditions mm -hmm. and light conditions. And I think playing off of those at the second level is kind of important. And John hit on that. The more the brighter it is, the sunnier it is. Probably the less we're going to see. Yes. Top water action. Absolutely. I like those big fucking clouds. Yeah. When you get those kind of summertime, summertime thunder clouds, thunderstorms, thunderstorms that roll in, that's when I'll switch over to top water quite mm -hmm. a bit when you get that kind of those clouds that yeah. roll in. Get that partly sunny, cloudy day. So if you were still watching on the, you were here in the, the first fly, which we incorporated the strung fuzzy fiber, <clears throat> then we went craft fur, um, and then we went flash. Sometimes what I'll also do is that a really good wing material, tail material, is straight up old crystal flash. So I'll take a big clump of that and skip the craft fur, still bounce it off the strung fuzzy fiber, try to find my length here, and pull, you always gotta do this on camera, pull it apart so I have a little bit of a tail. I'll trim that after. Now come in here, and this stuff, what's nice is like predetermined that I would marker this one. So I'll come in here as well, and I'll stagger cut this just so it locks it in. Kind of bend that over, lock, oops, and then come here and just kind of clean that up a little bit. All right, so that's going to take <clears throat> the hot spot marker really well. So we're going to do a pink fly that is really good for, you know, like more tannic, tannic water. You could add that, you know, we talked about the opal flash that's really good for sunny conditions. So this is a cloudy fly. So I'm going to kind of skip that material on this one. I forget what Senyo called this one, but raspberry or bubble gum. Okay, there you go. Mixed berries. There. It, oh no, that one no, has the no, blue in it. No, that's very <laughs> Nice. Use a little gator grip. Come in here. So both materials are locked in. I'm just going to rotate that across. This loom gator grip is kind of cool because it also has the shepherd hook. So if you're into doing your own dubbing loops, um, it has the, you just twist off the gator grip and then you have the shepherd's tool and then you can do, you know, really big with swing flies. You know, those dubbing loops, pull out that flash, pull that back.
those out. Lock that in. All right. I'm going to use the shrimp pink. <clears throat> and I don't know if there is a brighter material. So if you're going to hot spot this fly, the shrimp pink is really good. So again, we're just going to I'm gonna do this one a little bit different. So I'm going to put that down there. I'm going to come in and do that same wing. So I'm just trying to get a little bit of length out of here. Feels like a little bit much. So I'm just going to kind of focus on going down the sides. And you can see here that's a little bit long. So come in, grab, pull that out. That is such a cool picture. And there you go. All right. <clears throat> so now we're going to take the pale pink. And this is the kind of the fun part of this part of the fly tying. And if you're familiar with um, tying like clown eggs, so I took both and we're just going to mix. We're just going to pull that there. And then when you do it, you can see that it kind of gives you, I don't know, sprat splattered paint, dull and hot instead of one solid. So that'll be our next clump. So we'll pull some out. little bit thick. Less is more with this, so it'll really expand in the water. Pull it back. Make that little V. Keep that thread tension. Come back and it's locked in. Alright, so we always like to add, if we did it right, there it is. A little bit of white belly there. So pull some out. My fly tying desk during smallmouth season usually has like little clumps of these dubbings all <laughs> splattered out. I just did steelhead cleanup season because we're kind of getting into trout season for tying right now. And it was just like flashaboo pack here and flashaboo pack there. Add more flashaboo. Yep. All right, so now I'm going to come back to the top. And we're going to just like we did the blended one. And the last one will just be the light pink, the dull one, the one that doesn't, isn't as hot. Use our fam fancy whip finish tool. Hmm. Lock in the thread. <laughs> Use the well, force. <laughs> Big fan. Uh, the force. Yes. All right. So we're gonna come in here. Use our comb. Oops. Pull those out. Oh, got an eyeball. All right. It's like a top chef move. Yeah. You know? Like that. All right. So again, here we're trying to go even with the hook. So a little bit tighter on the pole. There we go. So now what we'll do here is that we have a bright pink marker. Sometimes your marker will come in and grab all your 
splash so just I'll just hit it real quick but then you can kind of see how that kind of glows there that little mix so and there you go really underappreciated color I think for a lot of predator fish is pink it's just something over the years that's grown on me more and more it's definitely either going to be like oh my word they'll just chew it every cast or they're not even going to follow it but it's definitely a cloudy day bait that i really do enjoy fishing out there so give it a run all right a few more questions out there and then uh yeah then we'll wrap it up wrap her up uh let's see gary has asked about top water techniques specifically poppers if you prefer you know what you think works best where they're letting them sit you know kind of tempt them in or uh, as he puts it the machine gun technique right <laughs> the two hand underneath don't stop yeah um yeah i'm a i'm a pop and sit so it definitely feels day in and day out in you know the day that they're just biting you could probably do anything and it will work the the majority of the time pop it let it sit let it float let it dead drift longer than you think too. yes yep oh yes and that's yep. for me at least i don't know about you but um still water as well same yep. deal i mean whether it's on a river or or a lake yeah one i'll do one pop and just yep. In, I might, might do, do a couple and then let it sit until all the all the ripples, ripples are yeah. gone. Ring, rings are a big indicator, and you could take the same lesson in how do I fish a smallmouth popper right? Go to your local bluegill pond, and you'll know exactly how to do it right. Because the majority of the time when you bluegill fish, it's got to be still. You'll pop them, they'll come up, wait, 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 and then boom. You know, so in that lesson is no different when you're on still water and then when you're on the river. It's like they're underneath that floating back with it as it's going. And you could take that same lesson and like, Brian, I know you do this. Like there's bugs that you need to twitch for trout. And then that fish is folding back with it and you better not move it. You know, so that's the other it's lesson. complex rise form almost. Yeah. 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 Joe's asking... Uh, when guiding smallmouth, what percentage of the time do you have clients throwing streamers versus topwater? Is the streamer bite better for numbers, or is topwater a better numbers game in your experience? Um, I think I can put more fish on with a streamer, and then topwater is more fun. So people will always, and how my day usually starts is that you're talking to somebody and how life is going, when can they fish. In the majority of the trips, let's say you have them at your disposal, like they have free reign, is that I'll start midday and I'm gonna fish to the evening. So we're gonna get all the fish that we can catch that are chasing bait fish. And then there's a time period in there and the light has changed where it's hard to get them on a, on a streamer anymore. And then we're gonna start throwing top water. And as the evening goes and things calm down, you know, that's usually when I do my best on top water. Some days it's like, as soon as we put it out there, they're on it. But the majority of the, the fish are gonna come later in the evening. And the other thing is like some of my biggest bass of the year are gonna be on top water. And I think it is that into the evening thing, you know, and part, part of it could also be is like, the more talented you are and the more you practice with the streamer, you'll get those hard bass that are the ones that chase but won't commit. And if anybody out there is hasn't bass fish yet, but you're into trout fishing, bass will teach you a ton about how to be a better trout angler. So if you can use bass, because we have so many rivers in the summer, to make yourself a better trout angler, then, you know, like example right now, if you go trout fishing, um, you better learn how to stall your bait because trout right now at 38, 36, 34 degrees aren't hard charging. You got to know when to pause it, leave it by that log jam, barely move it and then twitch. And on a 
boat that is drifting with a dead moving bait, you better know how to set the hook right because you're not going to get them. So, and then bass fall into that category. Like, you know, just how everything is stalled out. You're not going to really get yanked, you know, out of you, your rod's not going to get pulled out of your hand. I mean, you love it when it does, but the majority of the bites are like your pants are down and you're not ready and, you know, so. We're going to do one more question here. All right. Oh, yeah, again. Huh? And uh, in what situation uh, do you go with those style eyes? The bead when, chain. You know, the bead chain yep. that you're using for weighing it, or when might you keel the hook with lead wraps around the bend? Sure. Um, so for this style of fly, I, I'll run, this is the small. And then if I know I need to get the fly a little bit deeper, I'll run the mediums. And the eyes are just the eyes. I don't like, you won't see me glue on eyes. So the weight is there to help the fly get to a certain level. And then some flies, like whatever material, like I can tie this fly and add a little bit of deer hair in there and then i don't really like it's hard to work deer hair around the eyes so then we'll we'll keel around there if you've ever purchased the smallmouth dvd uh, i do like to wait even my top water flies and then i keel the back end of my gurglers so the hook rides so that the foam pops so that's what i'll do on that style but normally like a lot of my streamers because how i want the fly to swim I'm usually putting weight in the front so that it's either a cone, dumbbell, or the bead chain. And for almost all my smallmouth baits, because I don't want to go deep, I'll always do bead chain. Cool. All right. Oh. All right. Billy's here. <laughs> my daughter's here. Really? Or Storm. Stop. <laughs> Willie, stop, stop. Stop scaring the dog. Stop scaring the dog. Don't be afraid. Hi, Lily. Uh, we're just wrapping up our live uh, fly time here with Johnny Ray, and we want to thank you so much. Thanks, yeah. everyone, for tuning in. Thank, thank you, you, guys. Time. One last question for John okay. is, uh, how do people get in touch with you and uh, the rest of the Mangled Fly crew? Uh, www.mangledfly.com, Instagram at mangledfly. Uh, you know, if you can't find either of those, Brian knows how to reach me, so feel free to call Brian at the Northern Angler and he'll find me so perfect all, all right. right next week next wednesday we have Corey golden, Corey golden who's going to be tying some modern you know some classic styled wet flies with modern materials and he's caught fish all over michigan with these so really tuned to a wade angler as well so this is great if if you're a wade angler and you just want to cover a section of water really really well um and he's got some some cool techniques for materials that I know I struggle with like goose shoulder and things like that that you don't see as often as anymore. Yeah, a lot so, of the classics. Yeah. Twist um, on the classics. If you have more questions about these flies, leave them down in the comments below. We check those comments daily. We'll get back to you. Uh, everyone, thanks so much yeah. for tuning okay. in. Please stay healthy. And uh, yeah. we hope to keep see tying. you soon. Yeah, keep tying. Again, if you haven't, I know I keep hammering on it. Think about subscribing it helps us out hit that thumbs up that helps other people find these videos and find johnny ray so thanks everyone have a great evening we appreciate it everyone's just pouring in love for you john on the yeah, comment section thanks. so thank you big time see you everybody see you